Dear friends, good day to everyone on the other sides of the screen. We are so happy that you're here with us again. And thank you for your interest in polar regions and for your time. Uh, please don't be surprised that you're muted. Or if you are not, for some reason, please uh, also turn off your microphone just for the be better quality of the sound for everyone. So as you know, my name is Kate and I work at sales and marketing department of Poseidon Expeditions and I will be your host today. Before we actually take you to the Arctic, we would like to make sure you all can hear us well. So please use the chatter box and enter plus if you can hear us well. All right, we see plus is coming in and that's, that's good. Very good, thank you. Perfect. And you know, it's really great to see the familiar faces and you know that you're here with us. All right, it seems that we are all well connected. Uh, you can hear us well, all good. So dear friends, today we will talk about expedition cruises in the Arctic and we will be covering the following topics for you. We will do the small tour for Sea Spirit and tell you all about the benefits of the small ship. We would also later on, uh, we would like to take you to Svalbard, France, Joseph Linton, Greenland. And last but not the least, we will definitely feature one of our non-polar destinations, iconic British Isles. And right now, I would like to introduce my co-host to you and our guest speaker today. Ryan, please meet my colleague and our expedition, Ryan Hope English. Hello, Ryan. All right, guys, how are we doing? <laughs> Good to be Hello. here. <laughs> uh, as, you, as some of you know, I am doing the webinars from Moscow. And today we are talking to Ryan and he is located in Longyearbyen Svalbard. This is a, a cool place to be, right, Ryan? <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a, a cool place to be. We've had a very good winter coming into spring now. Uh, very yeah, good. Where dreams are made. All right, sounds good. And you know, I think we are we're having quite geography here already, and we are always uh, always interested to know from where you are listening to us, dear friends. If you could again uh, give us an idea on where you are right now and use the chatterbox and enter the country. All right, Scotland, India, Belgium. UK, Singapore, Netherlands, Malaysia, Spain, very nice, Taiwan, Italy. All right, anything else? Did I say Taiwan? I think I did. <laughs> all right, well, thank you everyone for joining us from all the different parts of the world. It's, it's really great that you're all here and we're all united by the interest in traveling up to polar regions. Uh, and you know, it's quite international and uh, I keep saying that, but it really reminds me of the atmosphere aboard our ships when we are going to explore the Arctic or Antarctica, because it's, it's really great feeling when people from the different parts of the world are gathered together on a small ship exploring the polar regions. This is really great. All right, well, uh, before we actually talk about the Arctic or, and the sea spirit, uh, I would like to tell you a couple of words about Poseidon Expeditions. So I have been with the company for a little more than nine years, and I'd like to say it's quite an adventure. I loved every day of it. And uh, the company started since 1999, and for about 13 years, we have been doing expedition cruises, hardcore expeditions in the Northern Hemisphere, taking passengers to the North Pole, to the Russian Far East. And after that, we actually realized that we have enough experience to take the next step. And since 2013, we are offering expedition cruises to Antarctica as well. We are a small privately owned company, but with big geography. We have seven offices worldwide. And um, I would like to say that right now on the picture, you can see the fleet of Poseidon expeditions. On your left, you see Sea Spirit, and we will be talking more about this ship. Uh, the lucky passengers that are traveling aboard Sea Spirit to the Arctic and Antarctica. And on your right, you see the nuclear powered icebreaker, 50 years of victory that takes passengers to the geographical North Pole, to the top of the world. And of course, this is 
an amazing and ultimate journey uh, and we we have been talking about it during our previous webinar uh i think right now is really a high time for me to properly introduce my co-host to you uh, and learn a little more about Ryan. So Ryan is our expedition leader in the Arctic and Antarctica. Ryan, could you please tell us a little more about yourself? How did you get involved with the polar regions and why is it still your passion? Yes, uh, well, that's a good question for those of you that don't already know me. Um, of course, I'm born uh, and bred, uh, so to speak, in England on the south coast. Um, and I actually studied in mechanical engineering, which is somewhat far away from the uh, from the polar regions. Um, but it was good to get a skill behind me. I've always had a passion for outdoors. Um, I've always enjoyed climbing, um, canoeing as well, kayaking, um, anything that involved being outdoors, really. So right from the word go i've always had a passion to be outdoors basically um and that dream kind of came true when i left engineering and uh, went to south france uh to the heat believe it or not of course from england you have to go to the hot areas eventually um so i started off canoeing um uh taking kids down the river river there um and then i decided actually well the heat was getting a bit too much and it was then in 2013 when i got my first opportunity uh, to go to Antarctica, actually on an expedition vessel, uh, but as a mechanical engineer, so I was fixing zodiacs. Um, so of course, I took every chance I could and went to Antarctica, and I fell in love with the polar regions. Antarctica just blew my mind, and from then on, I thought I was opened up to the expedition world, basically, where you could be a guide and you could actually come here and you could work here. Um, and that was really amazing. So from then on, I actually um, applied to join the expedition team um, and, and got a job as a guide and uh, therefore I was guiding. Um, and then shortly after in 2016, I moved up to uh, Svalbard, which is where I am now in Longyearbyen. Um, and again, to fuel my, my uh, polar passion, as it were, um, I've been doing a lot of uh, snowmobile guiding since then, um, a lot of glacier hiking, skiing, just generally just being in the outdoors. Um, and as Kate said, I've been um, with Poseidon now actually since 2015. So when they first chartered the Sea Spirit uh, to do the bipolar tours, so for the Arctic and the Antarctic, I've been on board since then and I've been working through the roles in many uh, different capacities, uh, kayak, uh, guide, logistics, um, lecturer, guide, and then ultimately, um, I had the role of expedition leader, um, which is a really great step for me because there's nothing more I enjoy than taking um, guests to have a once in a lifetime experience in the Antarctic and also the Arctic as well. Um, but yeah, that's just a quick overview of, of my life and why I'm loving the polar regions. It's just something about the, the extremeness um, and of course the cold that really draws me to it. Sounds good. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, one question that I think a lot of people are interested in, you know, with your experience that you've been in the Arctic in different areas, as well as, on, as in Antarctica, <clears throat> I don't want to say what's your favorite destination, but maybe where you leave a little piece of your heart when you go. What's that place? Uh, what's the area? <laughs> uh, it's very, very difficult decision, actually, because uh, every destination um, in the polar regions for me is a big plus. Uh, but for me, my heart kind of fell in uh, the Arctic in probably Franz Josef land, I think. Um, there's something about the real harshness of that environment. It, it, uh, I leave a little piece of me behind every time. <laughs> Franz Josef land. <laughs> Very good. Well, sounds great. And we will definitely have an opportunity to talk more about the epic islands of Franz Josef Land. And right now, I think it's really high time we make a little tour and give you a little more information about Sea Spirit. Um, as Ryan mentioned, we are using, we're operating Sea Spirit since 2015, all year round. So we're taking her <clears throat> to the Arctic and to Antarctica. This is, you're looking at the deluxe expedition vessel. I also would like to mention that it is a small expedition vessel, but 
big advantage. Uh, I would like to mention that Sea Spirit is perfectly equip equipped and fit for the polar explorations. We have 11 zodiacs. We can provide different activities uh, in regards to kayaking and camping when we're going to the Arctic and Antarctica. <clears throat> and of course, the maximum passenger capacity of Sea Spirit is just 114 passengers. It's like a small family or a group of friends traveling together. The atmosphere is just absolutely great. And of course, all the activities, all the experience, all the knowledge that you get during the trip is provided by the expedition team. Uh, on Sea Spirit, we have 13 expedition team members who are the professionals in different areas, helping our guests to get the best once in a lifetime experience. And talking about uh, the amenities of Sea Spirit, um, if we could go, yeah, perfect, next slide. So uh, Ryan has mentioned that it's a home away from home. And uh, you know, it has everything that you need for comfortable traveling. Of course, all the experience, all the beautiful views and wildlife happens outside. But at the end of the day, you want to go back to the ship, you want to take some time and think about everything what happened. And Sea Spirit has everything for that for you. Of course, you see on this picture that uh, not only we have the cabins, but we also have different public areas where our guests communicate, where they spend time, when they talk to each other and mingle. And I would also like to mention a little bit about the cabins that we have aboard Sea Spirit. So uh, all of them are outside cabins. And if we could go to the next slide. Thank you, Ryan. So talking about the cabin support spirit, to be honest, uh, we are very proud to say that every cabin aboard the ship is a suite. It's very spacious. And just to give you an idea, the smallest cabin aboard sea spirit is 20 square meters. If you compare it to the other ships go into polar areas, you definitely see that it's quite spacious. The other benefit is that the cabins are all outside. We have the windows, we have the portholes, or in some cabin categories, we do have the balconies. And of course, it's equipped with the private facilities. Really great place after the full day, active day outside to come back to think about what has happened. And right now I would like to give the floor to Ryan and he will make a little tour, tour for you aboard Sea Spirit. Great, thank you, Kate. Well, as as you mentioned, the uh, cabins on the Sea Spirit are some of the well are the biggest cabins that I've ever experienced on any expedition ship, um, and they are very very comfortable as well. Uh, recently uh, renovated as well, um, and every cabin has a window, which is great because uh, of course you're here in the in the polar regions to to look outside. If you're fortunate enough to be on one of the upper decks, you do get uh, the uh, opportunity of having a balcony um, as well, which is really, really great. Um, the Sea Spirit's a very, it's a, it's, a, it's a luxurious ship. It looks very nice um, and it's very comfy, but don't, don't get us wrong. Uh, we have the expedition side as well. So unlike some, some ships you would think is a very luxurious ship with a little bit of expedition. Here we have um, a lot of expedition that happens to be actually quite nice um, so I'm, I'm really really like the sea spirit from this point of view um, so here this is uh, the dining room and this is situated down on one of the lower levels on deck number two and this is where we are having all of our meals um, so breakfast and lunch are a buffet style um, and then we have the sit down a la carte menu in the evening uh, which is very very nice and we have our maitre d' Ruel who has been with us since the beginning. He, he reads uh, you guys, he reads the passengers so well um, and, attentive, and is very attentive. Um, if you have any dietary requirements, anything at all, you can just let the kitchen know and they will always sort it out for you as well. If you um, are of uh, an ethnic origin and you want to have uh, some maybe specialties in the food, um, quite often this can be prepared for you as well so um, they're really really flexible um, at lunch times as well if you decide that you're you're not a big lunch eater um, and you would rather have something a bit light 
uh, quite often up in the bar area as well. We'll have like paninis or uh, a sandwich, a selection of uh, a smaller buffet style of lunch. So you can sit up in the bar out the way and look outside, for example. Um, so there's many different options for the dining as well. Um, at once, once every voyage, we try to have a barbecue outside as well. This is really awesome. Uh, of course, weather depending, this is a really great day for a barbecue. The sun is shining in Franz Josef land. Um, everyone's wearing their parkas. Of course, it's not summer outside, uh, but it's really, really great. To, to, there's just a feeling about having a having an open barbecue, grilling some meat, and uh, and sitting on the outside decks. Um, in, in, a, in a foreign land is just something very special. So we try to do the barbecues um, as well, at least once a voyage, weather depending. This is the bar area um, on the Sea Spirit, and this is up on deck four, so it's a little bit higher above the waterline. So it's good to get a, a nice overview. Um, it's probably one of the biggest um, communal areas on the ship. So it's a place where everybody comes to mingle, um, especially in the evenings are very vibrant. We have music playing, Sixto uh, with his awful bar jokes and his uh, awful bar, uh, um, his bar tricks as well, uh, always keeping you entertained. Um, but again, it's, it's a place where everyone just comes together and you can look outside, it's really great, um, massive windows you can look at. In the evenings, you'll find the expedition team up here, um, either just for an informal chat or if you have any questions, or maybe it's a night where we're tying uh, knots, maybe we have a knot workshop running, maybe uh, Ida has some origami, maybe um, Chris has a story on uh, on uh, his time in Longyearbyen or in the Arctic. So it's, it's a really communal place and a very friendly place. And that's the best thing about being on such a small ship. You get to know people, you can become friends with people. So many guests have have made new friends um, and actually returned back on the on the vessel with with their new friends again and again and that's what I really like about being on board is um, I'm almost every trip now we're recognizing and recognizing returning guests and it, it feels really good um, just behind the li uh, just behind the bar we have the library um, as well our polar library um, really really well stocked we're very proud of actually our, our polar library uh, the la languages um, so many languages you, if you want to learn a new language our polar library is definitely the place to do it French German Dutch Chinese Russian you name it there's probably a book with that language in there so it's a it's an area it's separated from from the bar with the glass panels so it's a bit of a quiet area um, still very busy. There's some couches and you can take the books back to your cabin if you like as well. Um, again, really, really a uh, nice area. And then just above um, the, the library, we are outside and we're up on deck number five. And this is where we have a jacuzzi. We're very lucky on board such a small ship. We have uh, such a luxury item as a jacuzzi, which is always heated um, and it's always on. Um, apart from, of course, um, if we have a particularly um, interesting sea day, maybe the jacuzzi is closed for safety reasons, but otherwise it's always open for you to enjoy. Um, and this is a really, really nice uh, way. I, I can't imagine like when you're sat in the jacuzzi and you can look out and see the mountains with snow on passing you, there's nothing, there's nothing like it. So the jacuzzi is very heavily used, I think, in, in the evenings. It's a really great place to, to be. We're very lucky on the Sea Spirit as well. We have an open bridge policy, which means that you can join the bridge. Uh, you can go up to the bridge at any time. So you can go and you can speak to the officers. You can look at the equipment, the, some of the specialist polar equipment that we have on board. Um, but also um, in the Arctic, in the polar regions, we always have a staff member on Wildlife Watch. Um, so it's another place if you want to, if you have any questions for, for team members. Um, again, the, the bridge is a really good place to be. Uh, always somebody up there scouting, looking for wildlife, looking for any anything interesting, looking for anything, because at the end of the day, the itinerary, it's not set. Um, and for me as an expedition leader, if we see something awesome that we must simply check out, then we're going to go and do it. Um, and so, yeah, the bridge is a, good, is a key place to sort uh, this one out. The lecture room uh, is big enough to fit everybody. 
um, in. So it's really, really great. We have so really, really nice TV screens, big TV screens, four of them across. So you can sit either side of the room, you'll still get a nice view. Um, and it's a really great place. This is where we'll hold all of our lectures, all of our briefings as well will be done in this room. Um, and also at the beginning of the voyage, when you get your boots and your parka, your parka you can keep uh, for the voyage. Uh, which is really, really nice. You'll get some Arctic patches um, on the chest and on the arms, and you'll also be able to borrow a pair of really, really warm um, Arctic muck boots from us as well. So we definitely seat you and boot you. And again, this is the room where it's all going to happen. On the Sea Spirit as well, we're very lucky. One of my favorite things about the Sea Spirit is the aft marina. Um, some ships sit on the sides, um, which which works well. It's good. We have we also have the option to have the marina or to have disembarkation on the side. We don't use it so much though. Really, the marina at the back um, works very very well because you can use it in almost all conditions. It's uh, very forgiving, so it makes it very very easy uh, to disembark and embark um, guests uh, to the zodiacs as well. And of course, you can see the zodiacs are just above on the platform there. So it's really quick, really efficient to, to disembark everyone on a ship. Or well, when we have 114 guests, um, if the weather is uh, weather permitting, if the weather is nice, we can disembark, disembark everyone within 25 to 35 minutes. So it's a really, really quick, efficient disembarkation, which means that you can have more time on shore. And again, because it's such a small ship, um, some of the EAC, um, AECO regulations means that we can only have a certain number of passengers on shore at a time. Being on a small ship, we can get everybody on shore at once. Again, even more time on shore to experience the Arctic surroundings. This is the, um, a picture of the expedition team on board. We have a variety of members. We have translators, we have specialist subjects, historians. I think in this picture, it's actually quite funny. We have four of our expedition leaders <laughs> in, uh, in one picture here. Um, but again, everybody of, uh, of all, all abilities here to help you out. And again, because we're quite a large expedition team for such a small ship, it's almost a one to 10 uh, guided passenger ratio as well. So it's uh, it's a really homely feel as well. In the Arctic um, or in Svalbard, should I say, we're going to have um, high vis vests on for the rifle handlers. Some of our guides will be handling uh, rifles for bear protection. Um, but also in some destinations like Franz Josef Land, um, we'll actually be taking national park rangers on board who will be doing all of the, the safety work themselves. So again, we'll have more uh, flexibility for guiding and other onshore activities. Um, this is the expedition team introducing themselves at the end of the voyage. Don't worry, we all wear name tags. It's going to be very, so, so many people can be very confusing, especially when you have a beard and brown hair, like most of the guides, <laughs> it can get quite confusing. But otherwise, again, really, really great team. Thank you very much, Ryan, for the great tour. To be honest, uh, of course, Ryan goes to the ship much more often than I do. But even for me, you know, when I step aboard the spirit and see the beautiful and amazing people, you know, the expedition team, the crew and everyone, it really makes you feel like home. You feel you feel very good. Yeah. Uh, and right now we are ready to talk more about the Arctic. It's such a huge and vast area. And there are so many things to see, so many different areas to travel to. And uh, Ryan, we really would like you to give us a little bit of a general overview of what the Arctic is, and then straight away to Svalbard, Svalbard Franz Josef Land, and other destinations of our webinar. Great. Yeah, thank you, Kate. So this is an overview you can see from the slide is uh, the North Pole. Uh, it's the iconic center of the image here. Um, and then you have the Arctic Circle and the, the countries surrounding the North Pole. And it's a very special place, of course, um, at 66 degrees, everything above is counted as, as the North Pole or as, as the Arctic. So you can see here, you've got Greenland, Svalbard, Russia, uh, of course, you've got the United States, Alaska, and even uh, Norway as well, these surrounding countries. Um, and this area really is quite a special area because you have so many different climates in just 
one part of the hemisphere. Um, I know everybody probably thinks you have an Arctic climate and that's it. But really, there's so many different levels. You have a high Arctic climate, you have a low Arctic climate, and each of these uh, involve different things. So you're going to be seeing different things and you're going to be doing different things and you're going to be feeling different things. Um, and I think now that's actually a perfect segue to uh, Svalbard, uh, which is uh, really, well, I, it's my home. Um, I'm living on Svalbard. I'm living in Longyearbyen. Um, and this really is an area where you can experience everything. You don't have to be a polar veteran to go to Svalbard. You don't have to be a polar veteran to experience uh, these uh, vast, this vast nature. You don't have to be extremely fit because we tailor everything uh, to you guys, to the guest. And we do different things. Um, this picture kind of sums up Svalbard very nicely. You've got the glacier. This is up north in Magdalena Fjord, actually. You've got our zodiacs, our red ants, as we call them in the zodiacs, surrounded by ice, blue waters, and mountains. We have several different itineraries um, around uh, Spitsbergen. We have the Svalbard, Discover Spitsbergen, all ranging from eight to 12 days, depending on what time of the year you want to go. Because you can see um, on the slide here, every voyage departs from Longyearbyen and ends at Longyearbyen. So you're gonna be flying from Oslo um, in Norway up to Longyearbyen. That's the, uh, the only airport you can fly from. So wherever you are in the world, you're gonna to fly to Oslo first, and then you're gonna fly from Oslo to Longyearbyen. And this is where you're going to be joining uh, our sea spirit in the, the one of the biggest fjord systems here in the East Fjord. And then from there, um, it's these are coastal voyages. So we're gonna be spending time around the coast of Svalbard. And depending again, depending on the time of year, if you come more in the June, uh, July, beginning of July, um, there's gonna be quite a bit of sea ice depending on the year. So you're gonna be starting to head up north. You're gonna spend a bit of time along the ice edge. We're gonna be visiting uh, several, maybe a scientific station, for example, Neolosund, um, or maybe we go and visit um, a whaling camp at Smirnberg. Um, there's so many different things we can do. On some of our longer voyages, you can see that there's a dotted line. Um, uh, and some of our longer voyages, the 12 days and the 10 days, we're going to be trying to do a circumnavigation around Svalbard. So you can see here the lines we head up north or maybe down south first. It depends entirely on the conditions. And that's the best thing um, about being on an expedition um, on an expedition cruise is that we don't have a set itinerary. We, we can do whatever we want to do and we can go where the weather suits us. We can go where the ice suits us. We can go where the wildlife suits us. Um, and that's again, being on a small ship as well, that really helps. The West Coast, you're looking at the high Arctic climate. You've got the flowers, you've got uh, the vast um, different species of wildlife. And then if you head up north to the east um, into the pack ice, maybe we spend a day up in the pack ice to search for polar bears, uh, for seals. And then we head down the east coast where we have a high Arctic climate. You're going to be seeing different plants uh, and again, different wildlife, different surroundings as well. So Svalbard really has it all. If, you, if you're a virgin to the Arctic and you want to experience a bit of everything, then Svalbard is really probably the first choice. It is, would be your first choice. Um, again, we're running the cruises through from June, July, uh, 12 days will be our maximum voyage. We're offering kayaking um, on these uh, voyages too. Um, we do have a limit though of eight kayakers um, in the Arctic compared to the Antarctic where we have 16. Um, we have eight kayakers in the in the Arctic and that's just because of the safety aspect. Um, of course you've got walrus and you've got polar bears uh, which are a whole different ball game to be paddling around so that's the reason why we have the reduced numbers. Of course we don't offer camping because of the polar bear, the polar bear risk um, again. Uh, moving into the polar bears, yes um, of course everybody comes to Svalbard to see the polar bear. Um, and Svalbard is the home of the polar bears. I think there's, there is almost as many polar bears as there is people on Svalbard, looking at around two and a half to 3,000, um, both people, at, well, people two and a half polar bears, 
more up around the two and a half to three thousand. Um, and of course, this is why we have Wildlife Watch. We're always on the bridge. We're looking uh, for bears as well. But we must also keep in mind that there's a lot more to see in Svalbard that isn't just about the polar bears, although that is really um, one of the, the key draws, uh, the king of the Arctic, of course. Um, maybe we're lucky enough to, to have a view like this from the ship, uh, which is the most ideal situation. If you have a view, uh, you can see the bears and the ice flows. You can view the bear from a steady platform on the ship. You can get the zoom lenses in. You can get really nice pictures, just like this shot here. Sometimes we're lucky enough where we can view um, a bear from a zodiac as well, and that's also uh, equally as great. Um, the bears aren't always up north, like some people think. They aren't always on the sea ice. Quite often in the summertime, you'll find them on some of the islands stranded up north. Um, again, so there's different places where you expect to see polar bears, and that's just all down to experience of, of the islands and where, um, and where we decide to go. But again, as I said, there are other things to experience. Um, up on the west coast and up on the north, you've got the Svalbard reindeer, uh, which looks very different. It's very different of the reindeer you'd have on the mainland. Um, and actually on the west coast, this is down south at a place called uh, Trekhamna. Maybe you know it as Alkhornet, a um, very popular place for actually it's lush green vegetation. How many people think you've got grass and mosses in the Arctic? Up at 78 degrees north, you have mosses and and uh, and plants and, and and reindeer living healthy. So this is really really great. The reindeer they're not scared by people, so they'll just uh, they can just walk right, right up to you. So again, really nice opportunities for viewing wildlife. Walrus, same aspect. You've got mainly the males in the summertime, um, quite lazy. They come here to molt and to, to feed basically. Uh, so maybe we're lucky enough to view them from land. This shot is obviously taken with a telephoto lens um, because uh, being that close to a walrus um, is not only scary, but also they, they smell quite a lot as well. So of course you want to be keeping your distance because they do stink. Um, but the walrus, again, a, a true for me, again, it's, it's another Arctic king. It's something that um, it really is very special about these places. Um, Zodiac cruising. So we will have the opportunity to not only view wildlife from the, the ship, from the vessel, from Sea Spirit, we'll actually have the opportunity to get down in the Zodiac, into the water, um, and to go on a cruise to experience the, the islands and uh, everything that the Arctic has to offer. And for me, Zodiac cruising is actually probably just as good, if not more important than a landing. Um, and here's why on, on a Zodiac cruise, you can move around, you can go to different spots. For me, I like exploring. I like exploring new places. And I can still do that even after uh, five, six years in Svalbard, I can still explore new places from a Zodiac. Um, and we can explore glacier fronts, uh, we can drive through the brash ice, we can listen to the ice, to the air bubbles and the ice popping and it's crackling like, like Rice Krispies almost. Um, and then of course you can cruise around icebergs, you've got sea ice as well if you come a bit earlier in the season. You can see on the left of this zodiac here you actually have sea ice um, uh, and it's really great to cruise around the flows to look for wildlife. You can find walrus quite frequently on the sea ice. Of course everyone knows you can find polar bears also on the sea ice as well um, but also it's just being in that environment which is really something quite special uh, and you can stop and you can have five minutes of silence and you can just hear the arctic around you. You can see bearded seals um, yeah, it's a really, really great opportunity to for if you like to take photography, if you like pictures, um, actually from a Zodiac is a very, very good way uh, to to fulfill your dream of taking the, the epic Arctic shot. Uh, Ryan, just one thing to add here about the photography opportunities. On every trip we have in our expedition team, we have a photographer. And you don't have to be a travel, uh, a photo professional to be able to make great shots because our photographer, photographer will help you uh, with some tips on how to make a very nice picture on the bright eyes and things like that. So we're doing the workshops and even during the landings, the photographer is there with you just to give you the tips on how to make the best shot in the Arctic. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, 
paid we have some very very good photographers on board they also run lectures on board as well um, but usually on our Svalbard trips we don't have so much time for lectures because we don't have any sea days uh, so it's it's we're busy right from embarking the ship so quite often we run activities on shore where you can do a guided walk you can you can walk around with the photographer who can give you tips and tricks along the way actually out on a landing which is very nice um, so we do offer uh, different um, activities on the landings itself. Some landings we might do a perimeter where we will just have our polar bear guards surrounding the area and you can free reign within that area and you can take your own time. Um, or some areas we do guided hikes where it will just be um, more of a light stroll with a guide telling you about the arctic nature. Um, but also if you really are an energetic person you want to get there, you want to start powering and you want to do a hike then also um, on some land we provide this opportunity as well. So there really is um, uh, different opportunities for everyone. If you just want to sit at the shore, you can sit down at the shore, you can look at the ship, you can relax. But if also if you want to get going, you want to be energetic, then you can also do that as well. Um, again, guided um, tour. Most of our landings will have guided or will have guides on shore where you can go and visit a guide um, to interpret maybe some uh, flowers, some species or some geology for you. Or again, if you just want to be left alone, if that's your thing, we can also provide that for you. Um, the ship is also cruising around in the evenings and in the mornings and in the afternoons when we're getting to our next destination. Typically we'll have two activities a day, whether that be a ship cruise, uh, two landings, a landing and a zodiac cruise, two zodiac cruises. We'll typically have two activities. So you can also view um, the Arctic scenery from the vessel as well. So just because you're not outside on a zodiac on the land doesn't mean that you can't view um, the great nature uh, from the ship as well. This picture was taken, uh, I think, last year in Franz Josef Land. We have quite a few swimming bears in, in Franz Josef Land. Uh, so again, great, great opportunity to view from the ship. I'm sure Jerry will appreciate this picture. Um, we also offer the polar plunge um, as well and in all of our um, voyages in the Arctic. Um, so if you are crazy enough, uh, to jump into the Arctic waters and we do offer that opportunity from the vessel. Um, we do have to rope you up though, just so you don't swim away more than anything. <laughs> um, but no, it's really, really great. And the water temperature in Franz Josef Land, it could be as cold as minus one uh, degrees uh, centigrade, uh, which is around, I think, 30 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for, for, use, for you guys in the US. But anyway, polar plunge, really great. Just ask Jerry. <laughs> Um, does, um, does anybody have any questions about um, Svalbard or more like, uh, f yeah, does anybody have any questions about Svalbard maybe before we move on to uh, the next Arctic um, destination? Uh, I think what we will do, we will have a little Q&A session at the very end about right. all the destinations and uh, uh, Ryan, really great talking about the Svalbard because it has so many different activities and uh, you, you learn so much, but you also have fun with the polar plunge and not only. Uh, and we're moving on to Franz Josef Land. And just as a, a little bit of an introduction, this is um, a territory of the Russian National Park. And the Franz Josef Land archipelago consists of 192 uninhabited islands. And now back to Ryan to give you all the details about this absolutely amazing epic place in the Arctic. Franz Josef Land, what can I say? Um, the title, The Unexplored Frontier, that really, that really is the case with Franz Josef Land. Um, some people consider the North Pole to be the ultimate expedition, in which it is. But also equally, I think that Franz Josef Land is also the ultimate expedition. Um, usually, um, we will people that come to Franz Josef Land will have done Svalbard or Greenland first and then gone to Franz Josef Land for the next level up but that's not necessarily the case you can be a complete arctic virgin and come here um, but Franz Josef Land really is um, the the tip of the iceberg it's a it's an extreme place when I was talking about Svalbard we have our dual climate system we have low arctic climate we have high arctic climate Franz Josef Land you don't have that it's high Arctic climate and it's just high Arctic climate. 
the the most southerly island of Franz Josef Land basically starts where the most northern island of Svalbard ends. Uh, so Franz Josef Land is between 79 and a half to 81 and a half degrees north. So it's the furthest north you can possibly get without um, an icebreaker. All of our voyages leave from Longyearbyen, however. So again, you'll fly from Oslo to Longyearbyen. You join the ship in Svalbard in Longyearbyen. And then we'll sail from Longyearbyen to the um, archipelago of Franz Josef Land. Now, this is a, a, something that's very different from our competitors because um, we leave from Longyearbyen, which means that it's a lot quicker to get to Franz Josef Land. For example, if you leave from Murmansk um, or somewhere like this, um, you're going to be looking at two and a half to three days sailing time. Whereas from Longyearbyen, uh, depending whether we go north or south, you're looking at one and a half day, maybe two days maximum, uh, depending on the ice conditions. So it really is something very special. Also, we have a very, very good relation with the uh, Russian authorities. So we can actually clear immigration in Franz Josef Land. You see an island there called uh, Alexandra Land um, down there in the, in the, the southwest. Um, and this is where we clear immigration. So we're very lucky that we're able to do this in Franz Josef Land. That means that we actually get a lot of time to explore this unexplored um, area. Uh, we run trips from July uh, through July and August, which is uh, basically the high summer, you would say, in Franz Josef Land. However, saying that the average temperature is still around zero to minus three degrees. So <laughs> it really is an extreme place. 13 to 14 days uh, is a voyage. And of course, we'll be looking at spending around seven to eight of those days actually in Franz Josef Land itself. But Having said that, this is weather permitting. Um, you, as I said earlier, Franz Josef Land is extreme. The weather is extreme. The ice is extreme. Um, and this is actually what really makes the expedition. This is what makes it the ultimate expedition because um, it really is a place where not many ships have been, not many people have experience in going, um, and there's so many new places you can visit. Um, we offer kayaking as well. Again, eight slots as well. The kayaking is very, very popular in Franz Josef Land, I will say. Um, but really, the main attractions for Franz Josef Land is fog. There's a lot of fog in Franz Josef Land, and that's down to the climate. Uh, and again, down to the fact that there's so much ice in Franz Josef Land. Around 85% of the islands are covered, um, and almost 90% of the islands are actually covered in ice, so an ice cap. All of the glaciers are cold, which means that they're moving very slowly. They're below zero degrees. Um, so basically, there's a very, very small melting period in the summer where the glaciers can actually get smaller. So in some places in Franz Josef Land, the glaciers are actually uh, increasing. They're actually getting larger in size. But in a general rule, um, there's a lot of ice. Uh, the glacier fronts are really magnificent. The average ice uh, thickness for Franz Josef Land is 180 meters. Um, and the ice fronts, again, this is just a carving glacier front um, around 50 meters high. And you can even see uh, there's a polar bear on top of this one. Really, really great view. So it, it's just an epic place to be. Um, there's a lot of history in Franz Josef Land as well. Um, and this is also another main focus um, for Franz Josef Land is the history of the explorers, because um, every expedition that came here has a different a story to tell. This is one of the iconic landing sites, Cape Tegatov. Um, it's where Pyre landed, uh, who was the person to discover Franz Josef Land officially. Um, this is where he first landed. Um, and here you can see some of the remains from uh, one of the Wellman expeditions. So we, we always make sure that we have landings. We make sure that we go to these cultural heritage sites because they're very, very um, important places to go. This is another really, really iconic place. Um, if you've heard of Franz Josef Land, then you probably would have heard of um, uh, Jackson Island, Cape Norway, which is a place where Nansen and Johansen overwintered. Again, it's a very prestigious place. Not many people get to go there. Um, and again, the, the landing conditions are tricky, but we make it happen. We're a small expedition vessel. We can, we can make this happen. Uh, so again, another very iconic place to go. Um, one thing I will add is quite a few of these old relics. Again, there's, there's normally less than a thousand visitors a year 
in France, Joe's a flan. So we, in some landing sites that we land at, you really are the first, we're the first tourists to be landing there. Um, and you can see um, a lot of evidence of nature. Um, you can see a lot of evidence of the wildlife. Um, so you can see actually on the pole standing here, you can see there's a lot of scratches in the post. Uh, this has been used as a polar bear. Uh, the polar bear has been using this as a scratching post uh, throughout the time as well. Um, yeah, this picture sums up French Joseph Land really, really great. You've got a lot of ice. Um, you have a, a lot of interesting vegetation on the landing sites. Again, we offer a lot of hiking. We offer a lot of different activities on shore. You can sit down, you can relax. Uh, you can go for a longer hike. You can go for a guide, a guided tour with one of our history experts, with one of our geological experts. Um, so again, there's plenty of stuff that you can do on shore as well. Um, very, very interesting geology, for example. This is another a special place, Champ Island, uh, with the spherical uh, stone balls. Uh, there's only a couple of places where these exist in the world, but still a really special place to go. Um, I will say that, of course, Franz Josef Land, you have around five landing sites, which everybody knows of. You type in Franz Josef Land in, on the internet, you're going to get these five landing sites. But not every trip, we can't visit these five landing sites every time. But in my opinion, um, Franz Josef Land has so much more to offer. It's much more exciting going to the places where nobody has been before. Uh, you can find new things. You can find historical metrological rockets uh, from the 50s. You can go on Zodiac cruises around ice where nobody has ever been. Um, and that really is the draw for Franz Josef Land. Also, one thing I have not mentioned yet is the wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife in Franz Josef Land, believe it or not, for being so far north. Um, in Svalbard, we, we look for the polar bears. We've always got somebody on watch for polar bears. In Franz Josef Land, uh, the polar bears are looking for you, basically. Um, there's quite often occasions where we won't be able to do a landing. Uh, or we'll have to cancel a landing halfway through because a polar bear will show up, in which case we'll take back to the Sea Spirit, we'll take to the Zodiacs and we'll do a Zodiac cruise instead. There's just so many options, so many combinations uh, that we can be doing, um, which means that you shouldn't just focus on one thing. Uh, it's not all about landing, it's not all about Zodiac cruising, it's about being in this extreme environment, being so far north where very few people have been. Um, this, I would say, is, I don't want to say it's quite a typical view in Franz Josef Land, but this does happen quite regularly, especially when you have the, the sea ice. Um, it doesn't melt away in May time like it does up in Svalbard. You've still got fast ice all the way up until the middle of July, uh, which again is very good for the polar bears, very good for the ice experience as well. Uh, walrus as well, you've got the females with the cubs. Um, as opposed to Svalbard where you have males here in, in Franz Josef Land you have the female walrus, uh, very feisty, very dangerous, they quite often follow the zodiacs, um, they're very very different um, if you're interested in animal behavior for example if you've seen walrus before in the Russian Arctic or you've seen walrus before in Svalbard the walrus in Franz Josef Land are different and they behave differently as well you can see that actually here they're very very curious um, and they come to you as opposed to uh, moving uh, away or keeping their distance. So again, different mentalities here. Um, this picture just speaks for itself. That I, this is one of my favourite pictures actually. Um, on a place called Dead Seal Island in France, Joseph Land, you can just see the amount of wildlife that's happening. Uh, we also visit the the National Park headquarters as well. Uh, this is we always try to do this on every voyage. Uh, Takaya Bukta, otherwise known as Calm Bay. Again, uh, really important cultural heritage here. Um, it's one of the first uh, metrological stations to be set up in Franz Josef Land um, back in the 1930s, but it's still being used to this day um, as again the headquarters for the National Park as well uh, for the Russian National Park. You can visit some of the buildings, you can see some of the old Russian relics, you can have a look at how life used to be um, in this extreme um, in this extreme area. A lot of mosses as well, a lot of plants uh, to experience. Um, again, different vegetation for being so high up so far um, north in, in the Arctic. So really, just to wrap up Franz Josef Land, I would say that it, it's an extreme place, it's not for the faint-hearted, it's an extreme expedition, but it is 
an expedition. Um, I would always say, um, quite often I'm, I'm an expedition leader for Friends of Land and I will say that it's an expedition cruise because it means we can do what we like and we do what we can do when we can do it. So if we think we can do a landing at three o'clock in the morning because it's better for weather, then we're going to do a landing at three o'clock in the morning. Sorry guys, uh, it's not all about sleeping in, but that's the beauty of it. That's what's really exciting about Friends of Joseph Land. Thank you very much, Ryan. And uh, you know, I've been to Franz Josef Land in 2015, and I still remember it as it was yesterday. It's absolutely epic in terms of history, wildlife. You get you get really a lot of everything, and I think there is definitely something to each uh, to each of the tastes. And of course, if you want to enhance your experience and uh, to learn uh, the Arctic and Franz Josef Land a little bit deeper, then we offer kayaking. Ryan has mentioned that it's actually just for eight um, lucky passengers. And I would like to mention that uh, we take experience, uh, kayak, experienced kayakers for this activity. Why do we do that? Uh, because as Ryan mentioned, this is an extreme area and there is also wildlife. So uh, we really want to show you as much as we can with the kayaking. Uh, but at the same time, we want you to feel safe and uh, comfortable. Of course, there is a kayak master uh, always with the group doing the kayaking activity. And there is also a safety zodiac always with the group, just in case. And then I think we are moving on to our next Arctic destination. We will be talking a little bit more about East Greenland and one of the cruises that combines a little bit of everything. Ryan, if you could again tell us more about it. Yeah, um, so again, this is another uh, favorite voyage uh, among the expedition team, I would say. Um, Spitsbergen, Greenland and Iceland. Uh, and the thing is about this voyage is, again, it, it does leave from Longyearbyen. It starts in Svalbard, um, but then it's finishing up in Reykjavik in Iceland. And this is a way that you can experience a, a little bit of everything. You, we tend to do one day in Svalbard before crossing two days across to East Greenland. Um, so we do experience Svalbard. We sometimes go to New Orleans, the scientific station. We might make a landing a bit further up north so you can see some of the northern geology, um, maybe experience some of the pack ice, depending on how far north it is at this that that time of the year um, but really uh, the voyage is just for a taster of Svalbard if you're coming on this voyage to experience Svalbard this is not the voyage you, you're better off doing a, a Svalbard voyage um, but if you're if you want to go to East Greenland but you're undecided about whether you want to go to Spitsbergen or not this is a good voyage for a taster to get a taste of the Svalbard experience before heading over to East uh, Greenland and the, the good thing about uh, this um, voyage is that you spend, uh, we, we split up the time. So we'll spend uh, a couple of days up in the national park in uh, some of the northern fjords. And then we'll head down uh, to the Scoresbury Sun Fjord as well um, and uh, do some of the more cultural heritage stuff around there as well. So I'm just going to go through and explain um, a little bit about what this trip involves. It's a 14 day trip. Again, you're going to be having one day um, of landings in Svalbard, normally the first day, um, and then it's around one and a half, two days crossing uh, to East Greenland. Um, and then we'll spend uh, three days or so in the Kaiser Franz Josef Fjords and then head down to Scoresbury Sund uh, for the remainder of the time. And then another two sea days um, across the Denmark Strait going back to Iceland. And we normally spend a day or so in Iceland as well to experience some of the West Fjords, um, sometimes is a fjord or some other of the smaller fishing towns uh, so that you can get a sense of also Westfjord in Iceland as well which is again completely different. So this really is a true arctic package which sort of brings everything together very nicely. Um, but really the, the center of the focus here of course is East Greenland. Um, if you had to ask me what my second favorite destination was um, apart from Svalbard because I live here it would be East Greenland. Um, and that is because of, well, this picture here, really, you can see um, it's the Northern Lights. And I'll get into that a little bit uh, later on. Uh, we also offer um, two other trips um, of the voyage, which leave from Reykjavik and finish at Reykjavik as well. So this is purely East Greenland. Again, we'll have a day in the West Fjords of Iceland, um, but 
we're really focusing on East Greenland here and we're focused on the Scoresbury Sund um, fjord system in particular, which is uh, one of the biggest fjord systems in the entire world. Um, you know, the fjord system around here is over a thousand meters deep and the mountains are over a thousand meters high. Um, so East Greenland is really an area for landscape. It's an area for um, plants. It's not necessarily an area for wildlife. We do see wildlife, but if you're expecting to see polar bears, if you're expecting to see a lot of seals, uh, for example, then you'd be better off picking a Svalbard or a Franz Josef Land Voyage. But for scenery um, and landscape backdrop, East Greenland beats everything hands down. It's like Spitsbergen on steroids. Um, the trip's 11 days in September, so it's right in the autumn time. Uh, so you're getting all of these really, really great autumn colors um, as well. We offer kayaking. Again, eight kayak slots available. Again, kayaking is very popular on this trip. Usually at this time of the year, the weather is very, very stable. Um, and a lot of the frontal systems being blocked out because the mountains are so high. Um, so the weather at night, quite often um, the weather is not so much of a challenge in East Greenland compared to other Arctic destinations. You have really, really great light because you're coming to the end of the polar day. Um, again, it's in September and the polar day um, officially finishes around the 30th of August. So you really suddenly get into these really great twilight colors. Um, you know, you're getting the purples, you're getting the backdrop. Um, and of course, you're getting the northern lights as well. The northern lights are very popular on this voyage too. Um, we see them very, very frequently. Um, almost, I wouldn't say every night, but, but regularly. Um, uh, throughout a trip and the the best thing about uh, East Greenland is that again the weather is so calm usually it's very the sea state is very calm so this is one of the only places in the world where I've actually managed to see the northern lights reflecting off of the sea and that is just yeah that that is a heart melting experience I can assure you so really East Greenland um, for if you want to see northern lights uh, is a very very good option to do and the best thing about it is that you can see the northern lights in the evening and then you can still experience uh, the mountains and the backdrop during the day so uh, moving on to the wildlife side of things uh, we quite often see muskox in the national park they're quite elusive animals sometimes are very very difficult uh, to see but uh, again it's a true Greenlandic animal uh, very very shy but to get a glimpse of one to get a glimpse of one of these creatures is really quite quite special if you like the hike hiking is a very very good place um, in in East Greenland we focus a lot on hiking um, because the terrain is quite forgiving there we can do some really good long range hikes um, but also again if you like to sit if you like want to take in the scenery you want to take in the geology again we facilitate that we we have multiple activities you can do on on an excursion so um, don't be so worried again zodiac cruising uh, the, the size of the icebergs in East Greenland really are quite tremendous really um, you won't find icebergs this big um, anywhere else in the Arctic usually um, so we visit places this is a place called Red Island uh, and the the sea is very shallow around these islands so you get some of these big icebergs they have a very very big draft they get grounded on the shallow areas which is perfect to view from the land but also makes it really really great for zodiac cruises as well um, again Geology wise, uh, East Green is something very special. Uh, you can see the island here is sedimentary rock, redstone, but yet just on the other side of the fjord there, completely different, nice, um, different style of rock. Again, allows for a different uh, backdrop, a different landscape. So there really is a variety um, of things to see here, not just uh, the wildlife. I don't even need to explain this picture. Just East Greenland is that basically. Um, and it really is like that as well. It's not just a, a photoshopped image. It really does look like that. Um, and that's, again, that's why East Greenland for me is probably my next favorite destination. But it's not all about the wildlife, not all about the nature. We also um, visit 
uh, one of the towns, one of the only towns on the east coast of Greenland, or one of the most northern towns for sure. It's called Ithaca Tormit. Uh, a lot of T's, a lot of Q's, um, but it's a good place. There's around 350 people living here, um, and we go up to the local weather station. We visit the locals. Uh, we can visit the dogs. There's a lot of dog sledding going on, so we can go. Sometimes we can visit some of the puppies, some of the newly born uh, dogs, which is really great to see. Um, but it's really to get in touch with the town as well. Being such a small um, Arctic community is something that's also very special and something that's very unique as well, which you wouldn't experience anywhere else. Um, so sometimes they can open up the church for us. Um, uh, and again, we can go into some of the different buildings. We can buy local souvenirs as well. Um, they they really do make, make you feel like where you're at home. Um, again, outside decks, really good place to be. Barbecues, jacuzzi. Um, and to experience uh, just the Arctic surroundings and the Arctic nature as well. Yeah, East Greenland. Thank you very much, Ryan. Beautiful place and Northern Lights, of course. It's, uh, I think every, every traveler dreams of seeing that at least once in their life. Uh, Ryan has mentioned before the expedition parkas and of course on the pictures you have uh, all of our passengers wearing those red jackets and uh, just a couple of words. Uh, this is uh, the parka, the expedition jacket that's given to all the passengers at the very beginning of the voyage and that's uh, the parka to keep. So everyone can take it back home, you can use it, you can wear it and you know sometimes when you travel so much and you're in the airport somewhere and you see someone wearing this parka you you come up to that person you say hi and you know it, it really kind of makes you uh, a part of a small community um also just to let you know that this parka is uh very convenient for doing all the outside activities uh in the polar regions because it's warm it's light it's waterproof windproof it has a very nice hood to keep you from the wind also uh comfortable pockets for you to store your phone or your camera so really really great parka and um, uh, what we also do at the very beginning of the cruise we will have the uh, parka session where we actually uh, try out the different sizes and then the guests pick up the ones that are most convenient for them. Uh, we also provide the map boots that Ryan mentioned before for all the outside activities and Ryan if you can flip through the next slides so that I could show the um, uh, the boots right yes, here. Sir. You, yep, you can see the muck boots and uh, uh, they're very convenient. They're warm uh, for all the outside activities and we recommend to wear them during all the different landings or zodiac cruising because sometimes you have to step into the water and of course we want to keep you warm uh, and dry and safe. So we have all the gear for you during our uh, polar cruises. And I think now we're moving towards our last, uh, but not the least, destination, our non-polar non -polar cruises that we are doing at the very beginning of summer. So we're, we will be talking a little bit more briefly about the British Isles. Ryan? Okay. Thank you, Kate. One thing I will mention about the parkers and the boots as well, uh, we have a, a variety of sizes and we're always very well stocked. You don't have to worry about us not having your size. Um, we have everything from double XS, so double extra small, all the way up to four times extra large. So we have a big, big variety. Also with the muck boots as well, uh, we have sizes, which is uh, US uh, four, all the way up to US 15. Uh, so if you're from the UK, that's uh, three, all the way up to size 14. Um, and if you're from Europe, I think it's size 35 all the way up to size 47, something like this. So three, we have very, very good sizes uh, for everyone as well. And you know, one more thing that you mentioned before, Ryan, is the patches. Of course, we have all the Arctic patches and things like that. But if you want, if you're traveling in a special group and you want to have your own patch uh, put on a jacket, we can also do that for you. Yeah. All right, so the British Isles. Uh, you may think I would be the best person to speak about the British Isles because I am British. However, this trip is pretty awesome because, uh, yes, I'm 29 now and I have not uh, explored half of the places that, uh, that you go to on the British Isles. Uh, and that's something that's actually really fun because you're 
meet a lot of people coming from Britain who have never been to some of these places that we go to in the British Isles. Um, and it's funny because there's some of them, well, the reason why nobody's been there is because they're some of the hardest to get to, but also they're the most beautiful as well. Um, and that's what really, really makes it quite um, enjoyable. So for me as a, as a Brit to see, um, to see some of these areas in England, uh, in the United Kingdom that I never thought existed, I never thought my home country could be so beautiful. <laughs> um, but anyway, these trips, they leave from Plymouth, uh, right down in Cornwall. And uh, it's a 13 day trip and we're going all the way up the west coast over the north and we're finishing up in Edinburgh as well. We don't offer kayaking on, uh, on this voyage, but we do offer a variety of different um, excursions. So we will be making landings by Zodiac. Uh, we will be docking alongside um, the ship will be berthing as well um, and we will also be having multiple excursions either a guided hike um, or maybe it's uh, maybe it's a town guided walk around a historical ruin we go to quite a few of the uh, Scottish cultural heritage heritage sites as well if we're lucky enough we may get to visit um, Highland Park Brewery um, as well for for those of uh, our whiskey lovers, uh, which is often a highlight on the voyage as well. But we offer this voyage in May, um, at the beginning of May for the British Isles. So really the key focus is on, uh, on this uh, voyage is bird life. Bird life is key. You like puffins, 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 and more puffins. But also uh, a good range um, of, uh, of the, some of the bigger species, such as um, quite a regular one we see are gannets as well, the Atlantic gannets. So that's really, really uh, nice to see. But on top of that, again, cultural heritage, we visit some of the really, really small um, islands. This is the island um, of um, Iona, um, which has a, one of the oldest um, abbeys um, in England um, here on this island so we'll have a tour around that uh, we can visit again some of the some of the local culture as well but also zodiac cruises around the surrounding islands as well being up on the northwest there's a lot of basalt and a lot of different geology to what you're going to be seeing um, around the rest of the UK so that makes it again something else that's quite unique again visiting northern um, Ireland we can go to the Giants Causeway you know the giant basalt uh, steps you can uh, visit some of these as well. Uh, this is Conway Castle, uh, which also we get a chance to visit. Um, this wouldn't necessarily be a zodiac landing, or it would be a zodiac landing, but then it would be a, um, a short bus trip to get to the castle where, again, there would be a guided tour around uh, the castle as well. Um, quite often we get to have Vikings on board as well. Uh, we have uh, several, this is up in the Orkney Islands actually. Um, yeah, we get to experience some of the local cultures. This is uh, one of the Viking, uh, basically teams that come on board and they, they visit all of the ships uh, that come up to um, the area as well. Um, but really, the, the thing about the British Isles is, is it's a place where, again, not many people actually visit. Um, it's quite expensive to get to if you're not on a smaller ship. Um, again, the bigger cruise ships just don't simply don't go to these areas. Um, so again, being on a smaller ship, we can get to some of these areas um, and we can do it in luxury, but we can also, we can go out onto the land, we can look around and again, we can just enjoy ourselves um, again amongst the plant, plant life and um, and just experience the nature. One uh, of the main highlights we can visit is uh, there's a rock um, just off of uh, outside of Edinburgh with one of the um, called Bass Rock and it's one of the largest uh, colonies of gannets. Well it, I think it is the largest colony of gannet in the northern hemisphere um, and it really does look like this. You can't actually walk even on the pathway because there's so many um, gannets and to experience something like that is really quite amazing it's very loud believe it or not um, it's quite a, an interesting way of getting onto the island you have to zodiac from the ship um, onto um, a pier and then there's some ladders you've got to climb up so it really is quite adventurous but again a place where hardly any vessels get to visit and even not many people get to visit um, in general so that's just a little overview about the, um, the British Isles. And now we can move into um, the next trip after the British Isles, uh, leaving 
from Edinburgh is our reposition trip at Scotland, Jan Mine and Spitsbergen. Um, and this is when the sea spirit is going to be repositioning north. So we start off in Edinburgh, we visit Faroe, which is a very, very um, good island for birding, very big birding community on this island. Um, and then we can visit the Faroe Islands as well. Uh, we can bypass, we're getting into some of the Viking culture now. We visit um, the capital, Torshaven. Uh, the ship will come alongside, we'll have a daily excursion there before again continuing north um, to Jan Mayen which is part of uh, Spitsbergen is part of uh, the, the Kingdom of Norway there's a Norwegian metrological station on Jan Mayen as well again another island where really not many ships uh, visit so again this ship is running uh, from May until June It's 12 days we're offering hiking uh, opportunities in Faroe longer hiking again hiking in Svalbard as well for the end of the voyage um, but also photography options available we have a few more sea days in this um, in this trip as well which means that we have a lot more time to educate you introduction to Svalbard introduction uh, to the Viking culture uh, and things like this and again um, a little bit more specific to wildlife so it really is a nice all-round trip uh, for example this is in the in the Faroe Islands you can see some of the the, the native um, wildlife here um, again uh, going back to the Viking uh, culture uh, the grass covered houses of the Faroe Islands um, and again it's a good time to explore the town itself you will have some time where you can go to some of the local cafes you can get a taster for the Faroe Islands we don't spend so much time here um, but again it's a taster so if you want to come back to the Faroe Islands or you want to go there but you're not sure how to do it or what to expect again this trip is a nice introduction uh, to this one too um, we will sometimes pass by the Arctic Circle. So we'd be passing by, um, there's an island north of Iceland called Grimsey, uh, which is uh, right on the Arctic Circle. So maybe you can cross the Arctic Circle by foot. This might be an opportunity um, for you. Um, what else can I say about this voyage? Um, the Anmayan is the uh, has an active volcano um, and Yamayan is an island made from the volcano itself. Technically it's its own continent, um, it's its own continental plate, um, but the, to see this volcano in real life really is quite um, quite outrageous and landing in Yan Mine as well is really quite a specialist task. Um, we might land on the north side, we might land on the, the southern side depending on the weather conditions, um, but landing on a volcanic island on a volcanic strip um, is something that's quite special as well. Again, not many people get to visit Jan Mayen, so another nice highlight for this trip too. Uh, now I think it's over to Kate. Uh, this is, uh, I like this map actually, it's a really, really great overview um, of all the trips that we're running in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. Absolutely. Thank you, Ryan, for introducing all the destinations that we run in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, right now, dear friends, I would like to uh, summarize what we have been talking about, right? So we've covered so many different areas in the Arctic. And uh, right now, just a quick overview for better understanding. Uh, you see British Isles here. So this is exactly uh, where we start our Arctic season. So in May, we are doing, we are concentrating on the British Isles. Then when we are going north, when we are in Svalbard in June, we have a variety of voyages that you can choose according to your taste, according to the duration that you may allow for this trip. Uh, so in June, we are spending uh, our time with Sea Spirit in Svalbard. Then uh, in July and uh, half of August, we are spending at Franz Josef Land. And once again, I would like to mention that we are the only company in the polar in the polar expedition business that have the permission to go directly from Svalbard to the islands, just a day and a half at sea. Uh, July and half of August, we are spending at Joseph Land. Um, after that, uh, by the end of the polar day time, we are moving on to East Greenland. Uh, September, we are spending the cruises with Sea Spirit in East Greenland. This gives us a beautiful opportunity to see the Northern Lights and enjoy the nature and the wildlife of that area. Uh, and we really hope that you learned 
uh, many new things uh, joining our webinar about the Arctic. We've talked about so many different things. And uh, I, of course, would like to thank you all for your attention and for your time. And uh, what we would like to do now, we have, I think we have a couple of minutes for, uh, for the questions and answers, if there are any. Yeah, we would just like give you a minute to type in if you have any questions. But while you do that, I would like to mention that um, when you're uh, choosing Sea Spirit to cruise in the Arctic, to go to Franz Josef Land or Svalbard, you really get a great mix of expedition and comfort. Because as Ryan mentioned, we're doing everything possible to introduce you and to show you to these areas, these unique, absolutely beautiful and pristine areas. But at the same time, you're coming back to the comfortable ship. You make beautiful, amazing people that you become friends with. So it really gives you tons of opportunity uh, to explore the Arctic area. And I think now we have questions coming in. Uh, so one of the questions is, for British Isles, are shore excursions chargeable? Ryan, you can answer or I can go ahead. Uh, but I think it's worth mentioning that with the British Isles, what we do, we design the trip together with the expedition leader who is the expert in the area. Uh, and we include all of the tours in the price of this trip. Yeah. We know that there are tons of other cruises on aboard bigger ships where you have to, every day, you have to decide where you go, which excursion you take, and you have to pay extra. But with Sea Spirit, everything is included. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, one more question. Uh, your Arctic itineraries on Sea Spirit start from May uh, until September, and then it moves to Antarctica. Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Um, we mentioned earlier that we use Sea Spirit all year round. So during the summertime from May up until September or end of September, we are in the Arctic. And after that, we have around a month time to reposition the ship down to Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so usually around 20th of October, we start our Antarctic season and it lasts until mid-March. Um, there was a question about Antarctic webinar. Uh, we will be running Antarctic webinar at the end of next week, and we will surely be sending the invitations over to all of you. One more question. Is the boots included to, for the Arctic and Antarctica? Ryan, do you want to get that? Yeah, yeah, boots are included in both um, uh, Arctic and Antarctica, and even for the British Isles trips, um, if you want. The boots are stored on board, of course, they're, they're for the rental and they're for the guests to use for the entire voyage. So they'll keep the same boot for the entire voyage. Um, and yeah, so question is yes, the boots are always available. And in some destinations as well, uh, boots are actually mandatory uh, for the guests. For example, in Antarctica, um, depending on the expedition leader, the boots will be mandatory use uh, due to, um, of course, invasive species. We don't want to be bringing in anything in. Um, and of course, safety issues as well, um, you know, in Antarctica and also in Franz Josef Land, for example, conditions are extreme. So guests needs to have waterproof, um, waterproof um, footwear. Having said that, if a guest has their own boots, we do have occasional uh, guests that want to wear their own boots, um, which is completely fine. You're also welcome to bring your own boots if you don't want to wear the ones that we provide. Absolutely. Uh, there is another question. Are the excursions by Zodiac included? Uh, yes. Everything that we're having on the ship, everything that we're having outside of the ship, it's all included, except for kayaking in the Arctic and kayaking and camping in Antarctica. And there is a, a very interesting question that I would like Ryan to answer. Uh, do you make a wake up call when there is aurora or when you found a whale in the sea? Yes, yeah. Um, again, for me, if we see aurora, if it's at 12 o'clock in the evening, if it's at one o'clock in the evening, uh, we will be uh, making announcements uh, for the aurora. I know it can sometimes be a, um, uh, a tricky subject. Some people don't want to get up every night and see it. But uh, 
in this case, we normally make a wake up call. Uh, so we'll give a list um, to the bridge um, for, so if they see Aurora, they will call you on your cabin to wake you up uh, so that we don't wake up the whole ship. Um, so we, we do different ways, but for example, uh, if we're in Franz Josef land and we see a bowhead whale, yeah, I'm going to be making an announcement whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because this is an expedition, right? Exactly, and, exactly. You, know, you can sleep when you get home. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't see any new questions coming in. Uh, so if you have any, please check out our website. Have a look at the programs. Have a look at the videos. Have a look at the pictures. We have amazing pictures from our trips. And please feel free to contact us if you have any questions about any of the destinations that we feature. And right now, I would really uh, like to thank Ryan for joining us today all the way from Svalbard talking about our Arctic destination destinations. This has been really great, really absolutely amazing insight on what you can do and what you can see in the Arctic. Thank you so much, Ryan, for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to be here. I love talking about the Arctic regions anytime, anywhere. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, it's really great to have such, you know, dedicated uh, people in the expedition team and working together with you, Ryan. It, it has been a pleasure. Thank you, dear friends from all over uh, the world for joining us today. And of course, in the follow-up email, we have prepared a little bonus for you. You will receive a Svalbard guide from us and a very nice video tour of Sea Spirit. Thank you very much for joining and please stay tuned for the other webinars that we're planning for you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.